Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Collider Movie Talk panel. How the hell are you, New York City? Oh, this is going to be fun. Sometimes you come to a comic book convention, you're walking around, you're seeing a lot of things, you're buying a lot of toys, and sometimes you just need an hour to sit in an air-conditioned room, relax. You might not see the most famous people on this panel. We don't have any cool new movie trailers to show you. So what we're going to do is just kick you in the ass with a great hour of entertainment. How's that sound, everybody? I am not alone on this panel by any stretch of the imagination. I would like to introduce to you guys, first and foremost, one of the reasons why we are all here from the beginning with Collider Video and before that with AMC Movie Talk. Please welcome my good buddy, Mr. Dennis Zen, ladies and gentlemen. Let him hear it. You guys are really good when you're on camera, you know that? You guys, you guys really come to play. Next but not least, she is uh, a hometown girl, so please give a big New York welcome home to Miss Perry Nemirov, ladies and gentlemen. Coming up next, though, a lot of you guys probably had the privilege of checking out his panel yesterday, or maybe you stopped by his booth to buy some goodies. The one, the only, director extraordinaire, Mr. John Schnepp, ladies and gentlemen. He is already sweaty, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and last, but certainly not least, a young man you guys probably know from his show, Awesome Tacular, from his appearances on Movie Talk. Or maybe you know a little YouTube channel by the name of Mr. Jeremy Johns, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Jeremy, we'll, uh, we'll start with you. You're the only one that didn't film your intro. Were you worried about the reception you might get? Uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was more worried about the empty mics we're going to have to the left. <laughs> <laughs> These are for special guests who will not be showing up. This is our panel today, so what we want to do is take you guys through a couple of the late breaking news stories that we've gotten this weekend at Comic-Con. Certainly, we're going to open the floor to hear questions from you guys for a good portion of this panel. But I just want to kick off getting to talk with my buddies here about what your New York experience has been like so far. Dennis, you've been to this city before. You know the landscape pretty well. What's been something fun you've got to do here in New York during this visit? I mean, to be honest, we, our meet and greet on uh, Thursday night was great. All the people who showed up, thank you very much. Uh, it was great meeting all the New York fans, just because we don't come out here that often. And this is my first New York Comic Con. It's been a great experience. Yeah, the, uh, the meet and greet was at a bar called McSwiggins, which is like the best Irish drunk name you could possibly it have. sounds fake. If you know somebody named McSwiggin, he probably doesn't have a healthy liver. Um, <laughs> Perry Nemroff, you're back, and you introduced us to Meatballs. I did. If you were going to ask me what my favorite part of the trip was, it was taking the whole group to Meatball Shop and them all understanding that I've been right all along. Those chicken meatballs are incredible. Am I chicken right? meatballs were fantastic. You grew up in Long Island, though, so you're kind of like driving everybody around, and you're kind of telling us the ins and outs of the city. You took us to a nice bar the first night after Meatballs. Mm -hmm. You're kind of a good person to follow around. Seriously, smoothies, am I right? The smoothies. Yeah, all right. I don't know if everyone should start chanting that, but it's, <laughs> it's fine. Really, it's fine. <laughs> we highly recommend the Meatball Shop, though we are not sponsored by them. As of the moment, Dennis, get to work on that. John Schnepp, Yo. you were born in New York? I was born in the Bronx, Einstein Hospital. What's up? Pretty good. That's right. And my parents took me away when I was two. I had nothing to do with it. So. <laughs> but it's always great to be back here. I've been coming to New York Comic Con. I think it's 2006, either 2005 or 2006, I started coming here. And then I started having a booth here uh, five years ago. So I love, I love New York Comic Con. Love everybody here. 
Thanks. Oh. Uh, JJ, you got in last night. Yes. And the first thing you had on your mind was a good slice of New York pizza. Did you achieve your mission? I got a slice of New York pizza, and I, I, I found out that this particular New York pizza tastes just like pizza. And I, because uh, I heard the stories. You've, you've all heard the stories about how New York has the best pizza, so I just went down the road. What? Oh. He, he went to Domino's. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't Domino's. It was like this little place. I was like, that looks legit, like family owned. It's like called like Roy's or something like that. And so I went in there and I was like, I want, I want a slice of that pizza. It's a New York pizza. And he puts it down. I was like, that looks just like pizza. This dude over there is this super New York guy who's like, are you an actor? And I was like, <laughs> nope. He's like, you look like an actor. And I was like, I'm not. I can't remember lines to save my life. Uh, ask anyone on Ozzyptacular. And so uh, I, I get this slice of pizza, and he puts it on a plate. And I was like, oh, this is so I'm really sorry. I didn't tell you this, but can I have it to go? And he looks at me in the nicest way possible and takes a bag and goes, what? And gives it to me. And I was like, now that is the New York I've heard about. <laughs> But the, the pizza itself tasted like mall pizza, and so I was a little bummed out. I haven't tasted legit New York pizza yet. I'm sorry. We'll take you to some places tonight, dude. Yes! Um, we're going to take you guys someplace right now, and that's going to be a journey through the most recent breaking news that we've gotten in the world of movies. What Movie Talk is, for you guys who may not know, is movie talk by and for movie fans. We love movies. We are a huge fan of watching them, of talking them. We are the people that see a movie, and as soon as we leave, we are in the lobby, and we're talking, sometimes loudly, occasionally shouting John Schnepp, our opinions. <laughs> of what the movie was. And even if you're a weirdo like me and you just want to get in your car, as soon as the movie's done and be alone with your thoughts, eventually halfway home, I call my friends and I talk about movies because we are all so passionate about it. We love digesting it. We love hashing out what could be to come. So that's what we're gonna do right now. And I think the way to kick off, because I have Dennis sitting right here, I know you were such a huge fan of the first Pacific Rim. Yeah. And when Pacific Rim Uprising was announced, it's like, well, Del Toro's not gonna be directing it. How is this gonna fit in? Is this going to be a step forward? Are more people going to want to go see it? What did you think of the Pacific Rim Uprising trailer? Well, me and Perry went, went to the panel at Madison Square Garden, and it was cool seeing uh, Stephen DeKnight, who's taking over for Guillermo del Toro, and it's cool seeing the cast there, and then they showed the trailer. The one thing that kind of sucked was they, they dropped the trailer 15 minutes before our panel even started, and we didn't get to see it until halfway through. But after seeing, I, I, I like the trailer. It is very different from from the Guillermo del Toro version. It's it's more slick, you know. There's there's some Michael Bay esque shots in there that I'm you a little. You can say the T word. I'm not yeah, gonna get yeah, mad. Yeah, yeah. So it looks very Transformer esque. Uh, but but I have faith in Steven S. tonight, and, and I think I think some of the cool the designs of the Jaegers look really cool. I just got a text from John Roca saying, "Please say Transformers." Yeah. Um, <laughs> Perry, do you think that uh, Pacific Rim Uprising is uh, the way to go? Do you think that first trailer was a pretty good shot? I'm feeling pretty hopeful. I mean, really, even though I don't love Transformers and I don't want to compare a franchise with fighting robots to that, you can't really look at that new trailer and not see hints of it there. It's also, there's so many similarities in the story, too, with that new young girl and the, the little robot. They talked about a new little Jaeger that they're going to have called... Uh, I, don't, I forget what that one's name is, but it reminded me a lot of uh, Squeaks. Squeaks in the new Transformers movie, so I hear that and I'm connecting the dots, but really, the idea of it looking a little slicker than the first movie makes a whole lot of sense, because Uprising takes place 10 years after the events of the first film. You would expect that they had modified the designs a little, so the movement and the look of them, it kind of makes sense to me, and when you see four Jaegers come together and take on this gigantic kaiju, I, I have a feeling they're doing something right. I love the idea of a mini Jaeger. I think it's the coolest thing. Because <laughs> if you look at Jaeger like Jaegermeister, the alcohol, and a little Jaeger, you call it like Fireball. What do you? What, what would be the name of it, Jeremy? You like to drink. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> his name would be Gin and Tonic or Rum and Coke. That was. Uh, <laughs> those are the only two names I know. My favorite friends. You know what's funny is I got in late last night and just that jet lag. I was like, I have to be up in three hours, which is like 5 a.m. my time. So I, I went right to bed. I didn't watch the trailer before I came here because I came here and we did awesome-tacular stuff and it was a lot of fun. But hearing your description of the trailer, I <clears throat> Pacific Rim 1 was so fun, wasn't it? 
It was yeah. so cool. It was slick. It was rad. It, had, it, it, it did everything right. Monsters and, and robots fighting. I named my dogs uh, Gypsy and Danger. They're so adorable. <laughs> Real. Legit. I did that. I'm probably not going to name it Squeaks, <laughs> the next dog I get, or whatever Transformers nonsense. Scrapper. Oh, God. That's what the, the baby Yeager's called. Is it real? Did you Google that? No, I... I I took notes at the panel yesterday. Amazing! His name is Scrapper? Yeah. Oh, man. Is the director's name Johnny Bay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm Judge, scared. Judge, have you, uh, you pumped for the uh, Pacific Rim Uprising? I was. <laughs> oh. Right! Look, man, I think Steven Knight's super talented, and it's really hard to discern anything from a trailer, but the, the, the footage that I saw looked like a video game. The robots moved way too quick. They didn't have any size or weight or scale. And that's the thing that Guillermo's so good at directing. When he directed all of those sequences, I know it was a lot of it's in the rain. And, you know, it was like, but that showed you the size of these monsters and it showed you the size of these massive robots. And in this, the very first time you see some, like it's a robot like breaking through a giant building, it's all quick and it's like, I'm ready to fight. And I was like, this is like some horrible cutscene from a shitty video game. What am I fucking watching? So. That There's was right baby away. In the room. Yeah, sorry. There are children. There are children. They, they know sorry, what I'm talking about. They've heard it all before from their parents. I'm not taking the blame. So, <laughs> anyway, and then they show you way too much. You're like, I feel like I just saw almost all of the movie. They're all gonna have to team up and fight a super giant Jaeger at the uh, or ka kaiju at the end. So, hopefully that's not it. And I'm hoping that you know, there's how many months do we have before it comes out? It's in March. March. All right, so yeah, they could slow some of those shots down. Maybe, uh, you know, hopefully, I mean, I, that's my opinion. I haven't read anyone else's opinion, but I thought the, the animation on the robots looked, that's, like you were saying, transformery. I felt it was like cutscene video game. It didn't have any weight or scale to it. They look like this big. They look like action figures. So I don't want that in my film. You know, Pacific Rim. You know what's funny is you bring that up is scale is a hard thing to represent in a movie. And a couple things that help are, you, know, you, you ever look at a mountain or something? And, and it's so hazy because it's so far away. It almost looks blue. That helps. Uh, Mark Ellis, I know you're a big Magic the Gathering guy. We've seen this a hundred times with the Eldrazi, my friend. You see that picture of the Eldrazi. You're like, that thing's big because it's hazy. And then uh, when they move, yeah, like, uh, big things move slower than yes. slow things. Yeah. Or uh, slow things. <laughs> uh -huh. Small things. Uh, like you know, like, if you ever try to swat a fly, that thing is way too fast for you, you know, because, you know, the bigger things are slower than smaller things. And so the fact that they did represent that in the trailer. I gotta watch the trailer now. I just had a morbid curiosity. Yeah, and just to be nitpicky, a lot of yeah. overhead shots which automatically make all of the Jaegers look tiny and like action figures. Like overhead instead of like low to make the, them look large. Anyway. Jeremy, for a guy okay. that did not see the trailer, that was the most in-depth breakdown of a trailer mm, which yeah. you have not yet witnessed. That was, that's how you get a million subscribers, folks. Um, by round of applause, how many people in this room went to go see or are planning on seeing this weekend Blade Runner 2049? You guys. I hope you guys enjoyed it. It's getting great reviews, but uh, it doesn't appear that a lot of the country is in agreement with you going to see the movie because it was originally projected domestically to make 45 to 50 million dollars, and now the projections are down to around $33 million. So, Jeremy, what does this mean? Is it because Blade Runner, it might just be because people see the length of the movie. It's like two <laughs> hours and 45 minutes. Or maybe people hadn't seen the first Blade Runner and they're worried about not seeing this until they see the first one. What can you, what's the reason that you can give for the movie not doing better? Oh man, in a world of variables, let me pick a few. But you're right, it could be like, my dad told me about that movie back in the day. You know, <laughs> as my dad told me about the original Blade Runner. But Blade Runner was always it, it was always a cult classic it was always kind of a niche thing so i don't know how much this movie cost to make because about i about 150 mil about, 100, about okay. 150 mil. well that's probably a bit too much <laughs> um but I, I i enjoyed the movie but 150 million dollars for this sequel that everybody at comic-con wants to see and everybody at comic-con wants to see <laughs> Given the size of the country as a whole, that's, that's, I'm, I'm just saying, look, the spirit of this room fills up the country. I will tell you that right now. However, in terms of box office, it's just not quiet enough. So uh, it's a good movie though, you should see it. What did you, uh, did, did you review it already? I did review what it. What was did, your score? My score? Yeah. I'd buy it on Blu-ray. Buy it on Blu-ray? Oh my God, Perry literally yeah. went like this. She goes, 
I was surprised because uh, I'm sure some people watched our review, and I, I didn't give it a negative score by yeah. any means, but I did say a 7 out of 10. Mm -hmm. So normally everyone's saying, oh, I loved it. It's a masterpiece. And I do think it's a masterpiece in many, many respects. It just it wasn't for me quite like it was for a lot of other people out you, there. You know what's funny about that? I think there's a misconception for my rating. Like my rating, buy it on Blu-ray isn't 8 out of 10 or 9 out of 10. It literally means when it comes out, I'll probably get it. Best I can tell you. <laughs> no alcohol required simply means, it doesn't mean 7 out of 10. It means I probably don't have to have those gin and tonics we were talking about in order to enjoy it. So I should adjust my rating scale to an alcohol rating scale. Is Look. that what you're telling me? So how many blue moons do I need on your all right, scale? All right, blue moons. Ooh, that one gives me some hangovers, so... You know, back in my day, we just rated movies on a schmo scale. And now you fancy kids with your... With your drinking and your awesome tacula and your punching the camera, what's going on with that? Kids today. John Schnepp, what is wrong with the kids today? Why are they not seeing Blade Runner 2049? <laughs> well, uh, not being a kid and still not having seen it, I'm bummed out. But hopefully, me and Ellis are going to see it tomorrow. We've just been so busy, it's just been like, God damn it, I don't even have an hour to escape to see a two hour and 45 minute movie. So <laughs> I'm going to goddamn see it here. AMC, Empire, IMAX, uh, Atmos, Dolby, whatever. I'm sorry, I keep swearing, kids. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. I'm seeing it this weekend. So, uh, and everyone I know, every, all the critics that I trust, absolutely loved it. A lot of people called it a masterpiece. And you know, I'm a I'm a big fan of all the versions of Blade Runner, the final cut. You don't have to ask me. Um, but uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm really looking forward to it. It's it's kind of put me at, at ease because I was very against it mm -hmm. having a sequel. Like right. really, like Independence Day really didn't need a sequel. And now you're gonna <laughs> f with one of my favorite science fiction films. So I feel like to hear that a lot of uh, a lot of people who like heady science fiction gave it a you know a big thumbs up and said go see it you're not going to be disappointed and even plussed the original which a lot of people are like Blade Runner's boring I'm like you're boring that's my answer <laughs> you want to get into an argument with me just come at me son so anyway you know I get it some people don't have the patience or the mind width to understand a film like Blade Runner Hoo -hoo, shots fired just kidding it's cool if you didn't like it it's okay I got some other things I could show you um, so anyway Blade Runner, I can't wait to see it, but I have not seen it yet, like, uh, like Dennis saw it. So. Yeah, if you, uh, if you like the original Blade Runner, you'll like the new one. It's like the simplest way to put it. Yeah, Dennis, it's funny. Wait, we were all looking at showtimes for Blade Runner 2049 to see when we could see it, and because it's almost three hours, we're like, well, we could see the first half Thursday morning, <laughs> and then we could buy a ticket to a Saturday show and see the last 45 minutes. Are you going to get a chance to see it? I'm gonna wait till I get back to LA. I mean, we oh, were I so busy. You saw it. No, you I didn't see it because uh, they had a few screenings and they were full, and we had to we had to come here. Uh, we came here on Tuesday. Yeah. And we're prepping on Wednesday, so it didn't have time. I, I I'm looking forward to it, but I kind of want to sit down. I know some people did. Some people go on Thursday after the meet and greet. Did David Griffin David go? Went, yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Like after drinking a few beers, I, I don't want to go see a movie. I'm gonna fall asleep. It doesn't matter how how exciting it is. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, it's unfortunate that it's not doing well despite all the the good ratings, and I have a feeling that I'm going to enjoy it as well. But sometimes, you know, right now we have a lot of movies that are. It's very franchise dependent. It's it's based on if it, if people know it from a book or a video game or a comic book, and so it's tough. Even though Blade Runner is beloved in the film community and here at, here at Comic Con, it just I think the mainstream audience isn't that attuned to it. I like to think that the original Blade Runner was a gigantic flop as well. Yeah. Like I saw it when I was 13 and didn't understand it because I was like, why is he not shooting lasers? I was bored. I was 13. <laughs> so I get it if you're bored with it. But it's like you got to give it a chance. It's like a film noir. But, you know, so I don't care if it makes money or not as long as it's a great film. There's, I never care. If there's something to be said about it having long legs, though, because some of the folks that really love it think that this movie has a chance of getting some Oscar nominations. And if that <laughs> happens, they'll keep it in theaters longer. And if good word of mouth spreads, maybe it didn't make $50 million this weekend, but it could wind up making a lot over its run. Cinematography, for sure, for, for Oscar, absolutely. I would love to see present-day Schnepp go back to young Schnepp and be like, you're boring, and just <laughs> step out of there, and that'll be that. I don't understand it. Like, I'd like to, I've said this before. I'd like to go back in time and beat myself up <laughs> for being so stupid. Numerous years. I can go through at least 10 years. i got to slap myself. So anyway, that's one of them. I love it. Well, there's a little trailer that's supposed to be dropping tomorrow, and that is... Uh, for the Justice League, and it's the, probably the last shot we're going to get, Dennis, of the Justice League before we actually go see the movie in November. What are you hoping to see or to not see tomorrow morning? 
Um, I'm hoping not to see too much of the story. I feel like a lot of trailers today give away too much of it. Uh, I think Star Wars does a pretty good job because they show you scenes from, from the movies, but you still don't know what's going on. I mean, even after Force Awakens with The Last Jedi, we still are not sure where the story is going to take us, and I kind of like that mystery. Um, maybe we're going to see more of Joss Whedon's influence on this on this film because having doing uh, extensive reshoots on it, you know, changing this, the this, the score with Danny Elfman, I'm going to see what kind of tone tone they have with it. Yeah, Perry, I really just want to see Aquaman use more parademons as surfboards. How about you? Yeah, uh, I would like that as well. Mostly, more than anything, I'm focused on tone because mm. clearly that movie has gone through a lot over the past few months and I'm curious to see. It's going to be really interesting in the end when you've had two very prominent directors with very specific styles come together and finish a film together. So I'm hoping it offers a little of that. I do want a little story, though. I want a little story more so than, oh, here's your favorite heroes mm -hmm. coming together to save the day. I wouldn't mind just a little step forward, and then I want more Flash. I just want more Flash. Yeah. <laughs> John Schnepp, we're hearing some good things about the Flash in Justice League. Yeah, a bunch of little birds, and uh, I got a lot of little birds in Hollywood that like to whisper to me, and they told me that Ezra Miller steals the movie. So I was very happy to hear that. I heard there was like scenes in the film that are going to make you cry because it's like exactly what you wanted to see for from Super Friends to Just League of America. It's like iconic shots that are just like everything you've ever wanted to see. So that's really uh, exciting to hear. I want to see the black suit Superman. That's what I want to see in this trailer tomorrow. I want to see, because we know he's coming back. It's not like a spoiler. There's a bunch of posters. There's action figures of him. What are they going to be like? He's not in the movie. I don't care if Lex Luthor's not in the movie. Superman has to be in the movie, and he better be in that black outfit, and I want to see that in the trailer tomorrow. And look, you know, the trailer is an, an art form. So I've seen plenty of incredible trailers where the movie is garbage. So I'm hoping it's an amazing trailer for an amazing movie. I still have hope. Jeremy Johns, Justice yeah. League. Will it be great? Will it be great? I hope it's great. Uh, but that's a great point you brought up, Schnepp, is that I just want an accurate representation of what the movie's going to be. You don't want the light tone that uh, that Joss Whedon probably brought to it and have the movie be this gritty, gritty uh, Zack Snyder piece. You don't want the trailer to be super epic and gritty, and then you go in there and you're like, oh, that's a lot of joking. I want something that accurately represents it. I think it's a... it's. Essentially, uh, circumstances aside, a collaboration between two directors. I think uh, Zack Snyder has a lot more to do with the movie, you know, than uh, I, I, I think they both have a lot to do with the movie. But I read, the, I saw this thing where uh, here at Comic Con you see the, the outfits of the Flash and, and everybody in the Justice League, and the Flash has these nicks, these little little dents and dings and scrapes in his in his outfit, and it's, I didn't know this. It's because he runs so fast, he runs into bugs. And like bugs are like little BBs hitting him, and that's why he has to have armor plating. I was like, that is the greatest reason to armor up the Flash right. ever. So like, I, I didn't replace this that. part. I ran into a, a like a bumblebee, and it just that's broke it. So cool. So I, I want to. Yeah, I agree with you. The Flash, because in the last trailer and uh, the trailer before, but definitely the last one where he was like, oh yeah, they left. That's awkward. That's rude. And he just zips out of there. I was like, that's. I can't wait to see him, and if he steals the show, you need that one character to stand out and kind of steal the show. You know, you need the Tony Stark, and if it's going to be Ezra Miller Flash, bless him, bring it on. Yeah, I think Wonder Woman and Cyborg are the only two that actually get out clean when they arrive where they're going, because the Flash is going to have bugs all over him, Superman's got birds all over him, Batman has bat shit all over him, so there's a lot of things you have to deal with when you're a member of the Justice League. I want to let you guys know that if you want to start lining up, we're going to do some Q&A at the end of this. We have a microphone right over there, so if you guys want to go ahead and try to form an orderly line, we'll get to as many questions as we can. Right before we turn it over to questions, though, I do want to ask you guys about one more trailer that we are reported to be able to be seeing on Monday night, Monday night football at halftime, The Last Jedi trailer. Bum, 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 bum. Perry Nemiroff, what's the thing you most want to see in a Last Jedi trailer? Oh, man. And is his name Snoke? Uh, <laughs> no. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to see any more Snoke. I don't want to talk about Snoke anymore. I just want to experience whatever the next step is for that character in the feature. Because we got so little of him in Force Awakens that I feel like, all right, if that's the card you want to play, you play it then. And now when he comes back and we experience him in The Last Jedi, it's full force. And we really understand what they were doing with that character. But I, I kind of want to see, one, 
porgs being safe and happy and not eaten. I wouldn't mind one more porg shot, but really, I will take whatever they give me because I think that the Star Wars marketing campaign between Force Awakens and Rogue One did such a great job giving us so little in terms of shots of the movie, but making you feel like you're getting so much more out of it. Like, I'll never forget that first Force Awakens teaser trailer that it must have been a small handful of shots, maybe a dozen, and that was it. But that was enough to get that rise out of me and to get me so excited. So I just want a couple more really great telling shots that kind of chill me to the bone and make me excited. But really, that's it. Uh, Steph, you don't eat meat, but you eat fish and pork. Yes. I heard uh, porgs taste like chicken. Hmm. <laughs> That's what I heard. Um, Rub it in. You know what? I want to. I want to. I, I know, know it's going to happen. I want to see. Uh, I want to see those Praetorian guards. Am I saying the name yeah. right? I just love that samurai design. So I'd love to see like one or two quick shots of them in action. Hopefully against Luke Skywalker. I want to see Mark Hamill lighting up a, a lightsaber. Uh, I would love to see. Uh, Snoke in his weird gold smoking jacket <laughs> hanging out and petting a weird white. Or cat or something. <laughs> uh, I don't really know what uh, Snoke's gonna do. He looks weird, but I, you know, I'm in. So, Jeremy, what do we got to see from this thing? I love the fact that ultimately Snoke is Blofeld. Now he's Snokefeld. Is that what we're gonna call him? <laughs> um, I let you look for a trailer for a Star Wars movie. A trailer for a lot of movies. All you need an epic monologue and a nice swell of the John Williams music. And then when that goes down, I'm like, I'm in. Like I got my curtain cape on. I'm like bawling. <laughs> it's so beautiful. Uh, I just want to know that Porgs don't take out a legion of the best troops in the First Order. If that happens, I'm gonna be like Ewoks. Great. No, you can't do that. I agree. I would like to see a green lightsaber get lit, but not know who it is. Because this is where this is where the hypothesis comes in, my friends. I saw the I believe it's the black series that has the the lightsabers that you can buy at like Target for like $150. Now the blue one is called Ray's lightsaber, but it's in parentheses training, which by definition, if you have to differentiate, means she might get another one. So if you see a green blade light, that's no that's not saying it's Luke's necessarily. So this is where my brain goes. If it's not there, I'm gonna be really mad at Disney for giving me that toy. I love that Luke just has like practice lightsabers lying yeah. around yeah. like the cave. He's like, here, this is a training one. It's just plastic, but it lights up so you can get your reps in. Yeah, this killed a lot of kids, but you can practice with it. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Old blue lightsaber. Old blue, we called her. Yeah. Killed a lot of children. A lot of Today younglings. You get to kill porgs. Younglings and Tuscan babies. Kids. Yeah. I'll tell you what, man. I mean, I, I love the experience of actually just watching a Star Wars trailer. Like, that alone, like, gets me so excited that I would love to see Luke Skywalker light up a lightsaber in the trailer that we see on Monday. Dennis, what do you most want to see? Yeah, I, I'm with you guys. I want to see more Luke. I mean, we got so little of him in the last last movie. I mean, just one shot. But uh, this, if the trailer does come out during Monday Night Football, we all are going to be on an airplane. Uh, and, and we're thinking about trying to shoot a reaction because we're on JetBlue and they have ESPN. So we're going to try and shoot a reaction live on the airplane. <laughs> so amazing. That is amazing. But see, the great thing is we're not necessarily sitting together. Yeah. So we're just going to have to have somebody like, hey, this is really important. Yeah. Um, can you hold this camera and watch me weep as I'm watching this little screen? Uh, let's I'm, do some Q&A, man. I'm going to FaceTime you when that's playing because I'm going to be in Connecticut. So I'm going to be watching. You're going to be in Connecticut? Yeah. I'm Why gonna... didn't we get invited to Connecticut? Uh, I don't know. We're serving porgs. So. Uh. <laughs> All don't right. Let's, uh, don't look at me. Uh, very uh, appropriately dressed for this panel. <laughs> you look fantastic. What's, uh, what's your question? Uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Cassie. I am currently from Brooklyn. And thank you all for taking the trip out here to New York. I know that everybody here really appreciates it and knows the effort it takes to bring your crew all the way here. <laughs> So now that I did our little applause preamble to get us all ramped up for our Q&A, which no one asked me to do, I am going to, uh, my question, which has been approved, is so far this year, what has been your favorite performance in a movie, and just a couple sentences as to why. Ooh. Here, let me, let me look at my reviews. Hold on. <laughs> you can go last Keep and going. start at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Keep going. Keep going. You guys talk. My favorite performance in a movie that I've seen so far, it's kind of a tie between uh, Harry Dean Stanton and Lucky. If uh, you guys haven't checked that out, it's not an easy movie to watch necessarily. It's very slow and it's a small story, but he is so 
incredibly good in it and I think it's just a, such a amazing send-off for his career and I hope he gets Oscar recognition and the, the other one would be one that I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys have seen and that would be Hugh Jackman as Logan I think he was just oh. like so incredibly compelling in that role and like, like you talk about a send-off I mean that's if that's the last time we see him on screen as Wolverine I think it's a hell of a way to ride off into the sunset how about you Dennis yeah Hugh Jackman's one of mine but also uh, Patrick Stewart in, in, in Logan just playing the Alzheimer uh, just the way he, how vulnerable he is I, I think he should get nominated for an Oscar well, I'm not going to repeat anything from Logan. So I was trying to rack my brain for my favorites so far. Logan, Get Out, Battle of the Sexes, Baby Driver. But I think I'm landing, yeah. I think I'm landing on uh, Bill Skarsgård for Pennywise. I was just so excited. I really, I couldn't wait to see that movie. And, you know, he's coming off of an iconic performance from Tim Curry already. Really, the odds were so stacked against him. And if he didn't nail that voice and the physicality and really everything he did, I know there's a whole team around him to get the makeup and the effects right, but it came down to him a lot. And if Pennywise didn't work in that movie as, as well as it did, I don't know if it would be as special as it is now. Definitely. Loved, loved that. Uh, I'm going to go with Rob Pattinson in a movie called Good Time. It's a oh. very small independent film, just an incredible, incredible movie. I highly recommend it, and it's mainly because of his performance and the directing and stories. Emulating everything you guys said about Logan and loving the fact that when everyone, a lot of people on the internet saw Pennywise in costume, they were like, no, nope, <laughs> not that. He looks lame. So it's just kind of funny the, the difference a, a year can uh, make. But Jake Gyllenhaal is one of the best working right now. He was great and stronger also. Now, I don't know that he deserves it and stronger more than uh, Nightcrawler, but he's great in everything he does. So I feel like it's like Leo DiCaprio syndrome. It's like, we're going to give you this for a lot of stuff you've done. So that's not to say he'll get nominated because I thought he'd get nominated for Nightcrawler. What do I know? <laughs> yeah, I would also throw, uh, I would throw James McAvoy from Split in there. Ooh. I would throw, uh, I thought Charlize Theron was great in Atomic Blonde. The movie was, was okay, but I thought she was fantastic. And uh, so those are some of the other of our favorites of the year. So thank you for the question, Cassie. And thank you for answering. Very good on the mic. Tough act to follow. What's your name? <laughs> great. Uh, what's up guys, I'm Ryan, I'm from Long Island, I'm so happy you guys finally came to New York. I met Schnepp a couple of times because he's always here and he's always the best guy to come to. And, um, first off, if you guys are going to see Blade Runner here, I highly recommend the Lincoln Center IMAX, the AMC. Yeah. It's the largest screen in North America. I always go there for Star Wars, I saw Blade Runner there, my hair was standing on the back of my neck. I'm writing that down. Yeah, AMC, I think it's called the Lincoln Square IMAX, but it's right by Lincoln Center. Yeah, AMC Lowe's, perfect. You gotta go up like four escalators to get to the theater. It's, it's amazing, I see, I saw Force Awakens there, Rogue One. Uh, are you on the clock there. right now? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> right, but funny, there were two guys that, were, that worked there, they're right here. Yeah. They worked they're, there. They're on their break right they're now. They're on break, yeah, they just came right here. Well, no, I mean, they could have just started Blade Runner on the projection booth and then taken off for three hours and Where's come back. Where's our free tickets? Right <laughs> I've been a huge fan of you guys for years. Um, I, uh, the Schmoes are when they introduced me to Collider and when you guys were AMC. Um, what got me into you guys was the very beginning of the Schmodown, the very first, oh. the very beginning, the very first tournament. And uh, my question to you guys is, what is your personal favorite Schmodown match? Well, there was one between me and Robert Meyer Burnett in the inner geekdom, and it was excellent. The Hector Navarro one, look, look, I own ACDC's Back in Black now, okay? I'll never get that wrong. Again, all right? It's fine. It's fine. We're all, get, we're all okay. We're all going to get over it. But honestly, it was, it was a funny thing that I sat down one day, and I was like, I'm going to watch Schmodowns. Just because it's kind of, when you're there and you know the guys who make it, it's a little like, oh, you make content, that's great, you know, and it's, oh, it, it, it's awesome, and I've been there for the, for the tapings of it. But one day, just, I literally sat down and for about five hours watched Schmodown, so I texted Christian, and I was like, this is actually a really cool thing. It's like, actually a really fun thing to watch. And he was like, thanks, man. <laughs> and it was all like really sentimental between us, so a lot of the Schmodown matches are a lot of fun. We're, uh, we're glad we won you over, Jeremy. Yeah. Uh, Schnapp, you got a, uh, how many dwarves can you name? Uh, Bobby, Timmy, Skimmy, Scummy, <laughs> Scrimbles, Eggfoo. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, 
I liked uh, the, the most recent one that I actually saw was, I think it was uh, McSweeney versus JTE. And that was a lot of fun. So I like, uh, I don't watch all of them. I cheat. I just scroll to the end. I'm that dude. Because I don't give a fuck, really. Um, you know that. I, whenever I do the, the so, trivia, I don't care. So don't, don't, don't let Christian hear you. That. So, yeah, no, no, no. He knows it already. No, it's like, he, like, oh, you want me to fight the guy with the stupid beard, the fake whatever sock thing? Fine, great. I don't care if I win or lose. So it's like, because, you know, trivia, sometimes you're like, oh, dude, a oh, dune, a oh, quitsot's hotterick. Other times you're like, I can't even remember who wrote it. Yeah, so it's like, right. it depends on the day, like, what's at the top of my bubbly, weird brain? So it's like, I'm not that good at trivia, especially when people are like, you have five, four, three. I just, like, instantly get angry at somebody counting me the fuck down. <laughs> so I'm just not that dude. So, but I, I, you know, I love that Mark and these other guys are so good at it. So it's fun for myself to just watch it, and I just cheat. I'm like, I don't care about all those middle answers. Who won? That's, I'm that guy, so. Uh, Barry, Dennis? I know exactly how you feel. I was going to say my first match, Tough Beats against Double Jeopardy, because it's the only one I ever won, and it felt good to win. But I'm actually going to say my match against Brienne. That was my first singles match, and it's, it's not easy yeah. getting up there. And even though you basically live movies all day, like all I do is watch movies ever, but it's a completely different thing when you got to rip the Band-Aid off, and it's all on you, and you're under the lights, and you're hearing the countdown in your ear. And... You know, I'm kind of glad I did it, even though I lost and it absolutely terrified me that I finally jumped in and gave it a shot. But in the room, being there when it was taped, there was nothing like that free-for-all. Yeah. I mean, that was just, what, three, four consecutive hours of taping, and nobody turned their head for an instant. It was just such a fluid machine, and it was so, just the tension as everything went on, and really just one of the best communal experiences for a Schmodown taping ever. Yeah, mine is the free-for-all as well. I mean, that moment when Andreco took out uh, McWeenie, Roca, Dan Merle, and Bibiani at the same time, everybody in the room was stunned. It was, it was fantastic. And that was uh, my first time participating in the new version of the Schmodown. Yeah, the, uh, the free-for-all and Draco clearing the board was pretty great. I mean, personally, I, I really enjoyed getting to beat Roca. I really enjoyed uh, <laughs> losing to, to Merle. Watching Christian and Merle go at it was really entertaining. That was a pretty great match to call. Um, I think my uh, my face got about as red as you could possibly get. <laughs> just, I was so I was like a nervous coach watching it, but uh, they're all it's it's such a fun uh, sport to to talk about and to you know digest and and fight about a little bit. And it's just I'm I'm so glad it ca it's caught on like it has because it's really uh, it's something something pretty fun to do. So I, I love it, and as long as you guys keep doing it, I'm gonna keep watching. I'm gonna keep thumbing up. I'm gonna like. I'm gonna tell all my friends to watch it. It's one of the best things on YouTube, personally, and I'm just going to keep watching it until you guys stop doing it. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Get back to work. Thank you. All right. Next Thank up, we, so have much, a, uh, we have a Ghostbuster. Thank you for all you do for this city. <laughs> all right, guys. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, too tall for this. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for your channel. Uh, I, I know everyone here loves it. You know, if it wasn't for you guys, I'd have nobody to argue with uh, all their theories because I'm like, it's not a collider. It's, it's not real. Uh, but uh, no, my question is about reboots uh, because I know there's been a lot of bad ones or unsuccessful ones like, you know, Total Recall, Robocop, etc. But a lot of board game ones have been like, or game ones in general have been like being made recently, like with stupid emoji movie and like pixels and all these other ones. But there's one specific movie from the 80s that I've always loved. I can guess what it is. <laughs> you, it's, it's close, but no. Uh, and uh, the, the, this reboot, you know, I'm not going to mention. But anyway, uh, another movie um, that was, I always loved, and it was, you know, based on a board game, and I thought it was one of the funniest movies that I've ever seen. And I wanted to ask you guys, if they were to remake it, which I think they should, like, who you would cast in a clue. Yeah. I was going to say, you're going to yeah. say clue, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> um, I personally think clue is untouchable. I think it's a classic, but uh, I well, know that's up for debate. It's a fair question. So, Jeremy, do you have anybody in mind you'd want to put in that role? I think they should remake Murder on the Orient Express since <laughs> clue is untouchable, so I can get that expel. Oh, they are doing that. I'm pretty pumped for it. Uh, but I, who would I cast? Oh, just, just for funsies, who would I cast in clue? Gosh, I had Tim Curry in it. You can't Bill Skarsgård. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
all of the Avengers and the Justice League. I mean, you know, because they're just going to go for uh, all the, the superstars. I mean, you guys can just pick Wadsworth if you want. No, I mean, like, the original like, is great, but I think it's, like, a ripe choice. I think it's not, like, Back to the Future, you know what I mean? Like, that yeah, yeah. is untouchable. I think Clue yeah. could be, like, because the original be Clue, fun. I saw yeah. it in the theater, and they released it in three different, I think they had three different yeah. endings. Yeah. If you, it depends on what showing you were going to see, they had a different ending. And so nowadays, with digital technology, you could have like 30 different endings. You could even make a, a whole second half of the movie. Is, you're watching a totally different movie, like pick your own. John, movie. what are you doing? Write this. Get it done. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Barry, do you think, uh, you think Clue can be touched? Yeah, it doesn't really feel necessary to me. I mean, really, we, we're just, I mean, constantly. I mean, what was the last that we covered the, the Men in Black spinoff? It's just these things don't ever stop. And sometimes when they're great and they're special, I just want to live with that. But I will say the idea of using maybe modern technology to spice it up and do a little something different, like have those multiple endings. If, if you do something like that, that makes the experience different where it doesn't, because you bring up Independence Day Resurgence. And one of my least favorite things with sequels, reboots, remakes, all of that, is when you can't go back and watch that special something that originated at all and look at it the same way. So I would be a little fearful that that would happen, but as long as you could do something different enough where it's detached, maybe. Unless it's Power Rangers. So you're <laughs> Dennis, well, what do you got? Well, you did a good job. Uh, well, Clue, Clue is actually one of my favorite movies ever. I've seen it, I don't know, 40 times. I actually watched it recently when they did the screen at uh, Hollywood Forever. I don't know if you guys know this, they, they do screens at a, a cemetery uh, in LA, and everyone goes out there, and you get picnic blankets, and you sit there and drink wine, and drink, eat cheese, and, and, and watch a movie. And, and uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if they can capture that magic. There was something about the dialogue and the performances of all the actors that just fit right in, even though it wasn't a box office success. That just happened, and I just don't know if they can repeat that again. It's a it's a fair question, so I'll give you one recast. If we had to do it as Mrs. Peacock, I think Melissa McCarthy would be fantastic in that role. So. And I would cast Mr. Body would be Mickey Rourke. Yeah, <laughs> leaving pretty good in the original. Uh, thanks for the question. We right. appreciate thanks it. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah. Who's up? Hey guys, um, so my question is, uh, what are the chances of Ian McDermott returning for like a Star Wars spinoff? Because my the Emperor is one of my favorite characters. Ooh, I don't think Ian McDermott Ian McDermott returning for a Star Wars film. Yeah, is that what it? Um, I don't think he will. I I I feel like if they brought the Emperor back or something, it would negate the sacrifice Anakin made. Spoilers. Um, <laughs> At the end of, you know, I, I just, I, I don't feel they should do that. I know in, in the game they have the holographic thing with his, I don't know, his like brain AI is in there, like Dollhouse or something, but uh, I, I don't think he should. No, I, I mean, think, in like a spinoff of like. Or a sp oh, a spinoff of yeah. the Emperor and like, and, and Plagueis Ian, or something? Like, would Ian be open to like returning? Well, that'd be kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> like, I like don't maybe know. Maybe in a Vader. Maybe they should write film. a book about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, I, I, I love Ian McDermott as the Emperor. I mean, even in the prequels, you look at it and you're like, the dude's at least committing, you know? And yeah. so I love that about him. So um, I, I can see more of him. Yeah, he's, he's an incredible actor. I mean, definitely check out. He was in uh, some uh, Dennis Potter uh, BBC films, uh, Karaoke, Cold Lazarus. Check those out. The Emperor was great in that. Um, I don't want to see the Emperor back. I know there was some toy with uh, the James Bond dude holding the holographic baby Emperor or something. I'm like... I don't know what that means. I guess, you know, I kind of trust Ryan Johnson, so if they were like, look, we need the Emperor back, then it probably will make sense. I'm not gonna second guess the movie before I see it, just because there's a stupid action figure of it. So I'm not gonna get that worked up about it. W would the Emperor being a still alive bum me out? Yes, because I liked when he got thrown down that tube and died. Spoilers! Spoilers, yeah. Yeah, I'm with you guys on that. I'd rather not see it happen, but for all we know, maybe it's some sort of voiceover, like what we got in Force Awakens from certain people, or maybe it's some sort of message that pops up in the new film. If they do it, I mean, Ryan Johnson, we know he's a fantastic filmmaker. I'm sure he's going to do it well, but I, I certainly don't want the character to really come back. But today, the only thing I bought on this show floor was a Star Wars mystery box thing, and inside is a gigantic fleece blanket with his face on it, and it makes me so happy. 
I, I wouldn't want to see him come back in, in any of the trilogy movies, but a spinoff I think would be great. And, you know, the de-aging technology with the CGI is getting a, so much better. We see it in the Marvel movies. We saw Michael Douglas in, in Ant-Man and what they did there. So if, they, they, if he comes back and they do a spinoff that takes place in the younger years, I, I'm for it. Yeah, I'm going to give the old Darth Vader. No, but I, I just think that we've had so, like, it's been so great having Darth Vader and the Emperor in the movies for so long. I don't, I don't want to see, I don't really need to see what they were up to in between the prequels and Rogue One. I just, I don't need to see it on screen again. I think it's pretty perfect the way it is. So let's go create some new villains that we can get behind as well as, like, the Emperor. But, you know, I trust whatever Lucasfilm wants to do right now. So... Uh, thanks for your question. All right, thank you. We uh, we got about ten minutes left, so I just want to uh, I want to speed it up a little bit and go rapid fire right. as fast as possible. So what do we got? Hey guys, well, uh, just want to thank you guys first of all for being so amazing. Um, you guys are my religion. Uh, my question is to you is like, what do you guys think is like the best movie to take place like in an isolated location? Like movies like Room, Panic Room, Devil. Uh, well, you've you've listed three. What do we <laughs> do? My God, man. Uh, yeah. Moon, Moon would yes. be mine. Good it's a great one. Yeah. Yeah, I love Room. I love that movie. I love that book. Go check those out if you haven't. Oh, I said Moon. You said Moon. I, no, I know. Oh, I, heard, okay. I heard Moon. Oh, Duncan the, Jones is yeah, Moon, yeah, oh, and Lenny room. Abramson's okay. The Room. Not The Room. Which no, not Tommy The was Room. The, I'm totally saying Tommy room. Wiseau's The Room because it takes place mostly on that rooftop. So, <laughs> yeah. so. With the green screen. <laughs> Panic Room. We're going to go with a the theme here. <laughs> so many rooms, so many moons, so many The Rooms and Panic Rooms. I'm going to get out of the room, and I'm going to get into my car, and I'm going to say lock. Mm. Nice. 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 Good. Have I'm you ever hard. seen the Stephen Dorff movie uh, Break? That's another one. It's called Break with Stephen Dorff. Oh, is that the one where he's like stuck in the trunk? I yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic that, movie. That yeah. ending irked me. I'm not going to spoil it. You guys are going to waste your time and watch Pretty it. Pretty disturbing ending, yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you guys. Thank you very much, man. Hi, so what are your thoughts on Martin Scorsese's new movie, The Irishman, and how it's going straight to Netflix? Uh, I can't wait to see The Irishman, that cast, I mean, you know, De Niro and Pesci on screen again, it's, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I think it's cool it's coming to Netflix, it gives them more, uh, more credibility, more legitimacy, and uh, apparently an excuse to raise their subscription fees. Yep. <laughs> I was originally against Joe Pesci playing the Joker, but then when I started reading more, I, read, I got somebody sent me the script. I was like, it makes a lot of sense. Like somebody, you laughing at me like I'm some kind of a clown. I was like, can't wait to see. Oh, you're talking about that? Well, yeah, I got it. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, Netflix is kind of funny. We've talked about it a lot on Movie Talk before, where it's like Netflix was this. It was a thing that I got for free because I had a roommate who subscribed to it. And then it's gained in credibility. And then even now, there's that uh, Gerald's game is on there. And I, I pulled an Ellis watching Blade Runner 2049, where I watched half of it and I got to watch the other half. But uh, it was actually quite good. <laughs> the, the, up, yeah, the, the, yeah, the half I watched, I thought was really good. So, I mean, it's just more credibility. It's more accessible. I'm glad that maybe more people will watch it than the last one he did, that a lot of people didn't watch, that everyone was pumped until it came out and they didn't watch. I You're telling the Brad Pitt one? I'm right now. I'm going to watch mm -hmm. it as soon as I get on the plane to go back. But I'm so excited about pretty much everything Netflix is working on because even if the movie comes out and I don't love it, they're giving people so much opportunity. We just had Frank Grillo and the director of Wheelman in the studio, and the director is a first-time feature filmmaker, and he had the opportunity to make his movie his way, and they're giving filmmakers those opportunities. And then you have a movie like The Irishman with Martin Scorsese behind it, and they're making a real play for Academy Award recognition. This year they have Mudbound coming out by Dee Reese, and you, you need to see that when it comes out. No doubt in my mind after seeing it, and I know there's a lot more coming out later this year, but that's a movie we're gonna be talking about the rest of the year. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited for it. Scorsese is my favorite director, and, and look, right now, it, for movies in the theater, it's tough to, to get high budgets for dramas. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially if they have no connection to a pre-existing material, and so, Netflix is able to give that the freedom and the money to someone like Scorsese. And then, you know, I, I'm pretty sure they're going to release it in theaters, too, just so it qualifies for, for the Oscars. And, and you know, there's this controversy where you have people at Cannes booing Netflix and Amazon movies, which I, I think is ridiculous. And I, I dare them to boo Martin Scorsese. <laughs> cool. Thank, Thank you for the you. question. Mm -hmm. Goonies never say die. <laughs> Um, I, I first of all want to thank you guys because this year I've gone to the movie theater so much they almost know me by name. 
because <laughs> I, I listen, Jeremy, your reviews too, I oh, watch. Oh, thank you. And yeah. Um, my quick question is, what do you think as of this point is the underrated movie this year that people should go to the theater, get on DVD and watch? Logan Lucky. I think uh, a lot of people didn't see that just because it wasn't, you know, widely marketed. Uh, Channing Tatum was in it. Daniel Craig might have given a performance that he might get nominated for an Oscar for. It's a great story. It's a heist film. It's like a, has a, almost like a Cohen-esque vibe to it. Uh, I, I definitely recommend that. That's a great pick. I think I'm going to go with a horror movie called Raw. It's a French horror movie, and it's, it's kind of about cannibalism and also a coming-of-age story and also a sister story. It's just a really nice mix of material that justifies the more horrific elements where whether you're a fan of the genre or not, there is something that's going to really like touch and move you in that movie. And it's on Netflix. That just, too. Just kind of when she's not eating meatballs, Perry likes watching movies about cannibals. That's a fun fact. I'm going to say A Trip to Spain. It's like the third movie with uh, Rob Ryden and um, Tom Coogan. Uh, it's very funny. Steve Coogan, thank you. Thank you. See why the Schmodown, I would be like, and uh, Tom Coogan, would be like, get out of here. Uh, Steve Coogan, yeah. So funny, I would say that one. Well, I'm, uh, I'm one of the seven people who really liked Mother, and it made nothing. Yes, see? You and me. You and me. I found you the two other crazy one. people get the Spit. fuck out. You're my Patronus. You know that. I hated Mother. You Mother's. know that. You're my Patronus. <laughs> Mother. I saw, uh, I, there's a movie, like, I like when movies take risks and, like, like, they try to do something different, so this movie's not for everybody. I would not recommend, like, introducing the Belko experiment to your grandparents, but <laughs> it's just, it was a really fun attempt at something. I like when I'm watching a movie and I'm thinking the whole time, what would I be doing in this situation? So it's kind of a cool thing to check out. If you're not locked in in the first 20 minutes, you can feel free to just take your business elsewhere because it's not going to get better from there, but I would recommend checking out the Belko experiment. Oh, and I'd also say Brawl in cell block 99 i just got a chance to see it last week it is so ultra violent vince vaughn does an amazing performance just get ready for like intense like screaming go see it in the theater because everyone is like oh it's it's really satisfying cool thank you for your thank question. you very much guys mm, thank you how you guys doing um i had a question um did any of you in the panel notice the similarities between the pacific rim trailer and uh neon genesis evangelion mm. I mean, I, didn't, I haven't watched that anime, but I noticed people mentioned that during the first one as well in terms of the character designs for the Jaegers. So this one probably even more so because they're more slimmed down, this version, versus at least the, the first Pacific Rim. They're a little bit thicker, a little bit wider, and these are kind of more sleek. There's a certain part in the trailer where they're, they're actually synchronized together, mm -hmm. and it, looked, it was like it was taken directly from one of the Ava movies. And... Uh, there's another part with the, the color, the color scheme of the, the new Jaegers. Was, wouldn't it, wouldn't it looked, doubt it. In the second, well, the new trailer. Yeah. It looks like they, they were like almost dancing, like two of them in synchronization in the trailer just for a brief second. You got really sweaty about this, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like he gave it even over when else. He did a frame, frame, <laughs> like, frame, the frame by frame. Yeah. And then they're moving and dancing together. I don't even know I what you're talking about anymore. <laughs> Good to get excited about stuff, man. Know. Sorry, sorry if we don't have a better frame of reference. It's a good question, though. I, have, I haven't seen the anime or the trailer. Yeah. So I'll flip a coin to say yes or no. <laughs> we'll, we'll piece them together and we'll let Jeremy be the final arbiter on whether it's true or not. Um, we have uh, time for one more question, unfortunately, guys. So we'll. Sorry. Uh, oh, you guys are so nice. Okay, here, y'all can go at the same time. You two ask the question at the same time. Ask it literally. And then we'll answer it. It can't be about Neon Genesis or Battleship Alita. I don't even know what either of those things are. Okay, Battle so, Angel. Um, I just saw Princess Bride for the first time. This is a safe <gasps> space. Don't judge me. Okay, but I grew up on that book. I've been reading that book since I was like 13. And I just want to know if there is a book that you grew up on that you really loved the adaptation of or didn't like the adaptation of. Because I thought it was a great adaptation of a book that I grew up on. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's your question real quick? We'll answer both of them rapid fire style. All right, Perry mentioned uh, Baby Driver. What's your killer track? What was that? What? Killer track, killer track. Killer track. Killer track. Baby Driver? What's... Yeah. You know at the end, John Hamm is like, oh, it's your killer track, baby. And it's Queen, Bright and Rock. What's ah. Queen, Bright oh, what's and Rock. Oh, what's my song? Yeah. Highway to the back. Danger Zone. Yeah. Okay. I say Melvin's re Revolve. <laughs> um, and uh, for, for my adaptation of a book I actually haven't seen, it's a very good adaptation. Uh, I'd like to see Stephen King's Needful Things. I grew up. I'm, I want to see the morbid. Splinter of the Mind's Eye. I want to see them make an adaptation of that. That was like I remember reading that as a little kid, and I was like, "That's the next Star Wars movie." It wasn't so. 
I didn't grow up on it, but I'm really excited to see the adaptation of Ready Player One, because I read that soon after it came out, and yeah. that, that trailer surprised me. I thought that the, the chances of him getting the look of that right was slim to none. When the trailer first started, I'm like, oh no, this isn't good. And then all of a sudden, I got into it, and it looks like he might have pulled it off. Mm. Uh, I grew up uh, watch, uh, reading a lot of Agatha, Agatha Christie, so I'm really looking forward to the murder or on the Orient Express. I've seen the, the, the original version, but I'm looking forward to seeing a modern telling. And what's your killer track, Dennis? Oh, I don't know. I, uh, let's see. Probably something by Pearl Jam. Alive. <laughs> Alive's pretty good driving song. Uh, for me, I will go with, uh, I don't know if they ever made a movie out of it, but I'd love to see a movie version of Animal Farm, because it's the only book I've ever read. And... <laughs> Uh, there's an animation. The there's an animation. There's like it. four like, hey, versions like, of Animal uh, Farm. Yeah, it's like a commentary on soda. I see what the animals are doing. And as far as my killer track, I would highly recommend all you guys, if you ever get behind the wheel, be safe. Make sure you're driving at a reasonable rate of speed. Turn up the radio and play Van Halen's Panama because it's the most kick-ass track you could possibly <laughs> drive through. Yeah. And that is a great way to end the Collider Movie Talk panel. How about a huge round of applause for all of our panelists? Dennis N, Harry Nemiroff, John Schnepp, Jeremy Johns, I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys. Tell your friends about Collider Video. We love you. Good night. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode of Collider Movie Talk. You wanna watch more? Then click up here or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. And if you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.